In the saddle up the creek with no paddle, no aliens to battle where we want to go. Without being pompous, we don't need map or compass. We're launching Caddy Wampus on our new travel show. Space Crew Tom, only go with us. Space Crew Tom, on our podcast bus. Space Crew Tom, we see you recognize. And in space, no one can hear you scream. Loopy from our earworm, Space Chef TV. Hello, Space Crewtonians. Curdy here. I know things have changed a bit with the escalation of the threat of eternity, as well as the dire situation with Dandy and Quell, on top of dealing with the residual effects of the Kordax. Well, let's face it. It just doesn't leave a whole lot of time or space for travelogues. But in our trusty Van Helsing, we can continue to report from various locations as we try to save yours, mine, and our world's. Our mission may be changing, but we still appreciate your input and assistance. And we wouldn't have come this far without all you listeners out there. I emphatically concur, Cordy. And hello, audience. This is Sally, pitching in as only an AI can. Hey, Sally, what's with the puns? Allow me to dot com splain. As the show has progressed I have noticed the proliferation of this type of wordplay also known as paronomasia on the podcast. So I have decided to become a son of a pun meister in order to better serve our show. So I guess that would make you the Space Croutons Pun Meister of Ceremonies, wouldn't it? While well, you continue to be the everyday spud for the show. Huh? Our commentator. Okay, Sally, before everyone has grown tired of us, let's go to a commercial. I would caution against airing today's ad. It might make some people easy-queasy. Well, we've got no choice if we want to keep the show on the air. It's like my dad used to say. If it weren't for commercials, you wouldn't have time to get me that extra bag of corn chips I hid in the back of the pantry. So hurry up and don't open it. It's mine. And here, folks, is a word from Bessford Spare and Spare Alike Frog's Leg. For decades now, concerns about the environment have been ignored, and nature has taken the heat. Extinctions and mutations have affected flora and fauna in new and unexpected ways. And what has mankind done about it? Nothing. Until now, introducing spare and sparer like frog's legs, the other, other white meat. So what if global pollution has caused the common frog to grow extra extremities? Look on the bright side. We can now harvest only those legs for your dining pleasure with very little, if any, discomfort to the hoppy amphibian himself. That's right, the old croaker recovers and lives to grow even more limbs while you get a tasty dinner entree that tastes like chicken. Chickens are certainly happy about it, and you will be too. That's Bevsford's spare and sparer-like frog's legs. Look for them in your frozen foods case today. Well, Sally, you were right. I'm not sure that ad whets my appetite. Told you so. Well, at least we can cleanse our palates with another missive from our friend Pete. If you recall, he told us about his trip to Tunguska in 1906 and then time spent on remote Bouvet Island. Well, he has got a tale for you today. It's called a trilogy of not-so-terra firma. Roll it, Sally. Travel broadens the mind, they say. Well, they should shut up and mind their own business. My mind was doing just fine, handling the very narrow reality that was my world before Besford and Transportals and that photo on page 117 of Picture Days. Sour grapes! Besford replied when I said the same to him in the offices of Peter Portals for Mere Mortals Travel Agency, where I found myself dripping a small puddle on the floor after I dashed through the water spraying from the hydrant outside the wine bar just around the corner from home. Remember, I had just been shot at by a green diamond with a laser. 
Strange how those words no longer sound strange to me. But hey, my mind has been broadened, right? Listen, Bevsford, I hit the tea hard. I'll shove my sour grapes down your throat if you don't give me some answers. But of course, Mr. Mosley, we provide only the best in travel experiences. It is understandable that you are somewhat uneasy with your excursions there and then, but I can assure you it only gets more exciting from here and now. Who the heck was shooting at me? It will all become clear, sir. But first, there is a matter of a credit card to book your trip. He held out his hand while holding a card reader in the other. Are you serious? Not to fear. We offer a money-back guarantee. He smiled. Not that we have ever needed it. Well, what if I want to cancel right now? Mr. Mosley, you chose the premier travel package, which includes sight and sound auto-translation, which I might add you have already used in Tunguska. Besides, you already have the Folex, don't you? The what? Bevsford tapped the backpack, which I was now holding in my left hand. The Folex, Mr. Mosley. It was, is, and will be the whole focus of your trip. You don't think you and your traveling companions would be going through all of this if it wasn't really important, do you? Now, about the payment. We prefer Discover Card, for obvious reasons. I bit my lip. Fine. I opened my wallet. But I'm not going anywhere else until you tell me what the heck a Follex is and why I have it. You have it because you need it. But a word of warning. Tell no one else that you have it or you will not have it for long. <laughs> Bessford chuckled as he ran the charge and then as I went to grab the card back, he tossed it up in the air. Next up, the Well of Hell. Summer 1056. Have a nice trip. I lunged for the flipping card, slipping in the puddle beneath me and crashing into darkness. A wet hand slapped my face as I sat up on the cold, hard ground. A shaft of sunlight beamed down from hundreds of feet above, and trickles of water dripped down the walls around me. We were in some sort of round, deep hole, and the damp handprint on my red cheek belonged to Carmen. This has got to stop, I shouted. Behind Carmen was Gregor, reaching down to help me stand. I glanced about for my backpack, but it was nowhere to be found. We meet again, as agreed, he said warmly. Yeah, well, I don't remember agreeing to that, or anything else for that matter. That was part of the plan. By mixing up our timelines and only meeting at specific points, we have been able to keep our mission secret for everyone's safety. Carmen moved into a shaft of sunlight beaming down from high above. But now we can tell you what you need to know. You will understand why you said yes to all of this. Sergei's voice from the dark periphery of the hole made his presence known. Sergei, you're alive. Yes, my friend. But Carmen told me you were dead. I was, am, and will be. I am also alive, as are all of us who reside in a timeline. But for now, we have an important task to complete. I looked at the others standing with me in this hole. The well of hell, Bessford called it. Hundreds of feet below the Earth's surface, water dripping from above, forming stalagmites and cave pearls on the floor around us. Okay then, someone fill me in, please. Pete, it's about eternity. It's spreading, we all know that. And, and we also know that the Kordaks that we all thought could stop it are gone. It looked pretty hopeless. Worlds in every time and dimension are beginning to experience variants of external existence. On Earth where it started, bodies stopped aging, but minds did not. On other planets, beings are becoming zombie-like creatures, feeding on each other like cannibals. Still other civilizations are finding that their bodies are burning up in their sun's light, while their minds stay sharp, leaving them to experience constant searing pain and suffering. I'm sure there are more variants still to be seen, but all result in the destruction of life, as it has been known for eons. I nodded. The effects are starting on our Earth as well. Reports have been dramatic. But all is not lost. Using the transportals, I have expanded my studies of astronomy. Scientists everywhere are investigating the eternity phenomena and sharing their data. 
Energy waves have been identified that indicate the rate of a planet's eternity infection. While unable to stop the spread, we can now at least track the progress of these waves. I have been focused on this for some time now, and one day, quite accidentally, I noticed a planet at the farthest reaches of our galaxy that the energy waves appear to be bypassing completely. Upon closer examination, I found that life there has continued normally. No eternity, no mutations. So, they're immune? What did the other scientists say about this when you told them? He hasn't told them, but he told us. Gregor and I have been working with Sergei for a while. Hearing of his research, I offered my services as an early subject matter expert regarding transportals. I have a keen understanding of their obvious uses, and I have also discovered more nuanced and quite handy features that go beyond simple time, space, and dimensional travel. You're awfully young to be that smart, aren't you? One of the nuances I have mastered is the ability to alter aging in a way similar to time manipulation. So don't judge a book by its very young-looking cover. <sighs> Noted. I looked at Gregor. What about you? Me? Let's just say I've been concerned about eternity from the beginning. It started on my Earth, and I recognize the dangers immediately. So anything I can do to stop it, I'll do. That is what has led me to what I call my transportal scavenger hunt. I knew that if there was any hope of reversing it, I would find the answer out there, through those gates. That's how I met Carmen, when I stopped for coffee at a restaurant at the end of the universe. We've been a team ever since. Their good news is that we found evidence of a planet in a nearby system where something is happening that is nothing short of a miracle. On that planet, rampant environmental destruction was brought about by its population for centuries. The devastation got so bad that eventually there was only one populated city left. The rest of the planet was dead, desolate, empty. But somehow, a mysterious healing life force emanating from somewhere on that planet has turned things around. The planet has become lush and green again, the soil fertile, the air clear, the water plentiful. And what's even more exciting is that now, nearby planets are seeing similar healing to their environments. This healing energy is spreading outward. Did it reverse eternity on those planets? No. As of yet, we've seen no change in the eternity process on those worlds. So what good is it? We're going to find the source of this positive energy. We believe that if we can harness it and then place it in the right location on the immune planet, we can spread the immunity, fix eternity. I considered the info that was finally providing some context to my adventure, but there were still more questions. Why haven't you shared this immunity info with the other scientists? We saw what happened with the Quardax. People championing their own agendas fought and killed each other to get them. If word got out about this planet and its immunity to eternity, its inhabitants would not be safe. And, should the source of this immunity fall into the wrong hands, who knows how many other worlds could be placed in jeopardy by those controlling it. So, why am I here? I mean, I'm an online corporate trainer. I don't take chances. I never even traveled before this. What can I possibly do that you can't do without me? The planet where there's no eternity? It's a water planet. So? So, you're not who you think you are. Well, that's a bit cryptic. Okay, consider this. One of the things I have often wondered about regarding the transportals is how long they've been around. Most of the populations in the universe and other dimensions have only just learned they exist, but some civilizations have been using them forever, taking field trips in a way to study the populations of other worlds, interacting with them in every way. Oh. Okay. In every way. And that matters to me because... Pete, the parents you grew up with are not your birth parents. They adopted you as a baby, and you're not 100% Earthling. The hell I'm not! I felt the heat rising in my cheeks. Why are you saying this? It's impossible! Pete, it's true. Your mother was from Earth, but your father wasn't. We don't know if your adoptive parents were aware of who you are, but the folks at Area 51, they sure do. We hacked into classified records of your birth, blood test results, and U.S. government surveillance files. NASA has been monitoring you your whole life. My knees buckled and I awkwardly sat back on the ground. 
No, I I'm human. I've always been human. You're lying. Why would we lie? Listen, I know this isn't what you want to hear, but you asked. Sergei, tell him the rest. Sergei nodded and sat down next to me. Based on the evidence gathered by NASA and supported by our own investigations, we identified your father as being from the water planet Quell, a descendant to be exact. That's crazy! Why do you think you like to swim? The same reason anyone else does. It's fun, it's relaxing, it's good exercise. Why do you think you're so good at it? Practice! Look, I'm just a guy who likes jumping into a pool. There are millions like me on Earth, which is my home, 100%. Why do you always use water-based transportals, huh? Well, that's all Besford's doing. Uh, what you're telling me is wrong. Then why are you here, right now, in the Wall of Hell? Why go to Tunguska or Bouvet Island? You would not have made these trips if it wasn't true. I, uh, I, look, I, I don't know what to think. Even if my father was a, uh, a dissentient, what good am I to you? Sergei grabbed my arm and leaned in. That is why we are here right now. We needed to tell you about your father and what that means about you. Pete, you can breathe in water. That means you can deliver the life force energy wave to the right spot on the water planet and reverse eternity for everyone. And this life force energy wave, where is it? You just leave that to us. We'll bring it to you in a follux. A follux? I scanned the area again for my backpack. It wasn't there. Did I lose it? Did I lose the follix? Have I ruined the salvation of the universe before it even had a chance? Maybe I could retrace my steps. Maybe Bevsford could help. Look, I need time to think about everything. I can't commit to anything right now. Carmen stormed away from me. Jeez, I told you we needed someone else. Someone with guts, not this chicken man. Sergei stood up. Carmen, that's not helping. We have to give him some time. It's only fair. He looked down at me. Go ahead and think about it, but don't take too long. Once you decide to help, we will meet again. A sudden clap of thunder and a torrent of rain came down on us in the well of hell, and I was no longer there. Around me at the moment is darkness, a liquid darkness. And guess what? I am breathing, breathing liquid, and thinking, and deciding. And in my head, I'm writing postcards about my trip, which ain't over yet. Hey Pete, the tale you're telling is a story we want to hear, especially if it leads to reversing eternity. And if you do decide to go for it, we wish you all the luck in every world there is. And as a semi-professional adventurer myself, you let me know what we can do to help. Sally, any thoughts before we go? Based on the answers provided in this episode by his traveling companions, it appears that Pete is no longer the proverbial fish out of water. Okay. In fact, if he follows through, he could make a real splash. Enough. And I, along with our listeners, hope he dives right in. Sorry, audience. Before we end up drowning in all the puns, let's call it an episode and say goodbye for now. Keep us posted on anything you hear that could help us save the worlds, and keep peace in your heart until our next story time. So when we leave the station For each time or space Vacation If you do, well, you can kiss it. Space Crouton. Season 2.0. Space Crouton brings new worlds to know. Space Crouton. Subatomic and flow. As we cruise the Milky Way by tractor beam. And the Kordaks are just a distant dream. And our brains have turned to sour cream. Looking from our earworm space shanty thief. Space Croutons! Space Croutons is a work of original fiction. Similarities to persons, situations, or events, real or fictional, is coincidental and unintentional. 
Created and written by Jerry, Jace, John, Della, and Jeff Goodson. Episode story by Jeff. Original music by Jeff. Production by John, Patsy Puckett, Jeff, and Jerry. Featuring the voice talents of Patsy Puckett, Barry Shea, John, Jerry, Jeff, and Sally. Entire work copyright 2021 by Jeff, John, Jerry, Della, and Jace Goodson. This has been a Good Witch Audio Production.